day of the escape. He takes a pencil from behind his ear and underlines a passage in his prison issue Bible, Genesis 9, 5 through 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. He doesn't yet know it, but these words are going to come back to haunt him. All he's known in his life is violence. From being a young victim to adult perpetrator, he's killed and he'll kill again if anyone tries to get in the way of his escape. He and his accomplice, a man no stranger to extreme violence himself, will do something that's unheard of in the annals of American incarceration. Shawshank Redemption has nothing on these guys. Tomorrow, June 6, 2015 at 517 AM, both of these men will be discovered missing from their cells at New York State's Clinton Correctional Facility. This is a huge complex of sprawling buildings first opened in the mid-1800s that once served as a notorious insane asylum. Among the criminal fraternity, it's sometimes called Little Siberia, due to the freezing winters and the fact it's surrounded by miles and miles of rugged wilderness. A good place to get lost if you're a criminal, but a harsh place to try to survive. The authorities will find a cheeky note left for them, a slap in the face if there ever was one. Down a tunnel, another note reads, you left me no choice but to grow old and die in here. I had to do something. On a picture of Tony Soprano that the escapee has painted himself, he's written, time to go, kid, 6 5, 15. No one was supposed to be able to escape from this maximum security fortress. No one ever has escaped. The authorities can't believe what they're seeing. They now know that they've underestimated these two uneducated felons, cold-hearted killers as cunning and vengeful as Greek gods. Millions of dollars will be spent trying to catch them, but suffice to say they ain't intending to live behind bars again. They're armed and dangerous and they're heading to the border. Their names are David Sweat and Richard Matt, and this is the story of their truly outstanding escape. This is how it all starts. Day 1. Matt and Sweat have just started working together in one of the prison tailor workshops. Around 400 guys in Clinton make inmate clothes and other tailored stuff, such as lab coats and sweatshirts. They get 25 to 50 cents an hour. It's not much, but the job passes the time. Matt is known throughout the prison as Hacksaw. He's both respected and feared. Feared because of the fact that he got his nickname from dismembering a man. Respected because he'd do it again, but warn you first. Weeks 1 through 6. Outside of crime, these two men have another skill, the art of flirtation. And as luck would have it, the object of their flirtation is a civilian female supervisor who loves the attention of the men she supervises. Her name is Joyce Tilly Mitchell. She isn't exactly easy on the eye and she knows it, which makes her vulnerable to all the guys she's supposed to watch over. On top of this, her relationship with her husband lacks any sort of passion. He's Lyle, and he's a bright star in the story of lies and deception. He's a good person, in a tale full of bad people. He'll get a hit put on his head from a place that he least expects. When Sweat and Matt flirt with Mitchell, she can't help but giggle and blush. The first to really go after her is Sweat, who occasionally flashes naughty winks and smiles at her as he's sewing his clothes together on his machine. It should be said that Mitchell has been accused before of improper conduct with inmates, including Sweat, but as you'll see, she's really good at getting away with things. This is why she's fine with flirting with Sweat again, only this time she'll take things much further. Sweat has the instructor's job and Matt a regular machinist's job. Good friends, their machines are side by side. All day they plan and conspire and stare over at Mitchell. Both these guys have been designated as a central monitoring case, meaning great care should be taken to watch them. Sweat falls into this category just because of the sheer brutality of his crime. The reason Matt is monitored is that he's an escape risk as well as a brute. He's escaped from another prison in the past. A document relating to him reads, All necessary precautions should be taken whenever it's required to move the inmate outside the facility regardless of the reason. So despite having some very sketchy backgrounds and not having great prison records, they are allowed to work in the tailor shop. Lately, they've had quite a good run in terms of staying out of trouble, so both have a cell on what's called the honor block. Here, there are 180 prisoners and 174 cells. Security is just the same here, or should be, but the inmates are at least allowed to wear some civilian clothes, have much more time to hang out with other inmates in the recreational areas, as well as getting a bunch of other privileges. This will all help Sweat and Matt. Sweat's described by another inmate as being very, very self-sufficient in all ways. He's clever and he's resourceful. He's even a bit of a survivalist. Matt is the chatty one, described as sociable and gregarious. He's also tough and can back up his fierce reputation if need be. He's a survivor but far from being a survivalist. He's in his late 40s and Sweat's in his early 30s. It's Matt who introduces Sweat to one of the wonders of painting, a hobby they'll both employ as a means to escape, and one in which Matt shows considerable talent. Weeks 12 through 17. It's now plain to see for the other inmates in the workshop that Sweat and Mitchell have got something going on. It becomes more obvious when after a while she starts going to the stock room with him. 
Michio comes out looking all flustered and red in the cheeks. The inmates know exactly what's going on, but one of the guards in the workshop is more interested in reading his book than watching out for inmate-supervisor relationships. Weeks 18-25 to 25. She gets reported for treating the inmates like friends and being way too close to some of them. Mitchell fires back, complaining that she feels she's being harassed for no reason. She then files a grievance, and to be honest, the prison doesn't want the hassle, so she keeps up her job. Let's now introduce another main character to the story. He's correction officer Eugene Palmer, a man who's been at Clinton for 27 years. He's the go-to guard for inmates when they have a problem, and he and Matt are described as being two peas in a pod. They've been close, too close, for years now. If Sweat's working on Mitchell during the day, then Matt has Palmer in the palm of his hand on the honor block. It's ideal for the pair. It makes life easy, but at the start, they don't realize it also provides a means to escape. Matt often gives his paintings to Palmer, who's impressed with the artwork. He's especially impressed when Matt gives him paintings and sketches of his own family and house, which he does on a few occasions over the years, and he works really hard at completing them. The better the work, the more favors come Matt's way. When Palmer starts dating Clinton correctional officer Mary Lamar, he even commissions Matt to do a bunch of paintings of Lamar's family. One day, she starts crying outside Matt's cell when he gives her the finished piece. She can't believe how amazing it is. Palmer is made up. He's made this woman happy and he owes Matt big time. Matt also informs Palmer when violence is about to happen. One day, they both walk into a quiet corner and Matt warns, you're going to lose your prison. It's a powder keg. It's about to explode. My informant tells me that when it goes, they're going to show no mercy. For this, both Matt and Sweat enjoy the best conditions in the block receiving TVs from Palmer and as many painting supplies as they want, in spite of the fact that a paintbrush can be used for all kinds of wicked purposes. But more importantly, when Palmer escorts these guys back to the block from the workshop, he sometimes takes them a way in which they don't have to pass through any metal detectors. This is foolhardy, to say the least, especially when you find out what kinds of things Mitchell is giving them in the workshop. Weeks 26 through 29 Things are about to change. The prison authorities receive an anonymous letter. It states, Sweat and the workshop supervisor Mitchell are having inappropriate relations, and it's damn obvious to everyone. In the storeroom, says the letter, the two bang like beavers. The complaint even says that Mitchell is always doing favors for the white guys, but she's always on the backs of Latinos and blacks. Further down, the letter states, it's funny that she goes to the next door with the same guy once or twice a week for three to five minutes and comes out with nothing. I've noticed that since I started working here in the past five months. In short, Mitchell is furious and denies everything, but in the end, Sweat gets 30 days in the punishment block without privileges and is taken out of the workshop for security concerns. That's when he's told he'll be moving into a cell away from his buddy Matt. He loses his place on the honor block and now has no way of making money. This will play a big part in his wanting to escape. Mitchell's outrage and the tsunami of complaints she sends to the warden go a long way to help keeping her job. The prison doesn't dare bring charges against her knowing that she'll kick up a stink about harassing a female but she's more upset about losing the love of her life. She even cries in front of some of the other inmates. She's lost the man she believes really understands her, cares for her, and she's also lost the best damn machinist she's ever had. Suffice to say, things go really downhill in the workshop after Sweat is gone. Weeks 30 to 51. Matt asks Palmer to help make him the workshop supervisor and Palmer does it. Now, Mitchell's special little helper is Sweat's best friend, and if any other inmates complain, he'll get them thrown out of the workshop. She's also quite attracted to Matt, who, it has to be said, has a way with women. He makes me feel special, Mitchell secretly tells one of her friends. He just understands me. I still haven't gotten over David, but there's just something about Richard. I don't know. He just listens. Matt is by far the better manipulator, even if it's Sweat that has a high IQ. In no time at all, Mitchell is breaking all the rules for him, one time buying him a $9 pair of reading glasses on eBay. This is about as big a transgression as you can get, but for the time being, their relationship is not sexual. For her efforts, Matt paints her a picture of her son, an 11 by 16 inch work that she's overjoyed with. Such a thing isn't easy to pass to someone in prison, so Palmer takes it from Matt, then drops it off in Mitchell's car. Since Palmer has all those years behind him, no one at the gate asks him what's in the package he now has that he didn't come in with. This is how lax things are. Week 52 Matt tells Mitchell he really needs a pair of gloves as his hands are hurting when he works out. Can she buy him some, he asks, telling her he's only too happy to paint something else for her. Hmm, she says. Can you do dogs? Sure, Matt says. Dogs aren't a problem. Week 53. Mitchell breaks the rules even more times, once calling Matt's daughter for him and passing on a message. It's at this point that Matt is thinking this love-struck woman will do absolutely anything for him. Meanwhile, even her husband Lyle knows she's been helping Matt and receiving these paintings in return. Lyle tells her one night, This ain't worth losing your job over, darling. They're nice paintings, but this could get you in serious trouble. He can snitch on Palmer if he wants, but there's one thing you don't do in prison and that's tell on someone even if you're a guard. 
Weeks 54 to 55. Mitchell keeps smuggling stuff in, including 70 containers of black and cayenne pepper, 10 10 ounce packages of Cafe Bustelo coffee, several decks of playing cards, and numerous other prohibited items. It's at this point that Sweat's busy brain gets going. Still irked about losing his cushy job, one day he turns to Matt and says, I just want to get out of this place. I want to be free. I want to go live somewhere away from everybody. He then says, if Mitchell will get you anything, why not ask her to bring stuff in we can use to escape? He says the gloves and the glasses will already come in handy, but they can do even better than that. We have the ideal situation right now, he tells Matt. Do you think she'll be up for it? Matt laughs and says, she's freaking nuts. She'll bring us whatever she wants. Just tell me what you need and I'll get her to bring it in. Sweat envisions getting through his cell door by exploiting a vulnerability in the locking system and then walking to the yard where he'll use his new tools to get a rope over the wall. He tells Matt he needs a star-headed screw bit and some putty and later Mitchell doesn't let him down. Matt tells her these things are for his art and the frames he'll make. Week 56 through 59. Sweat changes his mind and says to Matt, what about getting through the sewer system? He says for this they'll have to be in cells next to each other. He explains that they'll saw through the wall, get into the tunnels he thinks are back there. Matt asks for another favor from Palmer. Can he help get Sweat back into the tailor shop? Not necessarily his tailor shop, but any of them. If this happens, it'll mean Sweat gets a cell back in the honor block. Palmer does as he's asked, and stage one of the plan is complete. Week 60. Sweat is now working in the workshop 8. Matt is working not too far away in another shop. Mitchell occasionally now sees Sweat as they pass each other in the corridor. Each time she smiles and surreptitiously gives his hand a little squeeze. This mother and wife, who's old enough to be his mother, is acting like a love-struck teenager. For the time being, she had no idea about any escape plan, but she's more than willing to bring stuff in for Sweat and Matt. Week 61. Sweat is now in cell A623, right next to Matt in cell A622. He was assigned another cell on the block, but has paid the guy in A623 $100 worth of smokes and given him some homemade pornography books. Sweat says to Matt, we need saws, hacksaw blades, that's what you need Tilly to bring in, as many as possible. Five hours later, Mitchell is at a Walmart store close to her house, handing over $6 for a bunch of hacksaw blades. She uses cash even though she's already used her credit card to buy other items. The next day, she places them at the side of Matt's workstation. Back in the cells, Matt gives three of them to Sweat. It's time to do some sawing. During the evening, they both use the blades to start cutting a 10 by 10 inch hole through the 3 16 inch thick rear steel wall. As handles for the blades, they use rubber bands wrapped around cloth. To prevent any noise when they move the heavy table away from the wall, they put tape under the table legs. The sound of the sawing is also obscured, much thanks to the general din of a prison and the fact that every evening, guys slam dominoes down on tables. They've sawn their first tiny hole. Success! There are air vents and attached ducts behind the wall, which will also have to be sawn through in time. The little bits of filings will be picked up by magnets the guys have stolen from the workshop. Weeks 64 through 65. They do this every day from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. when most of the other prisoners are in the mess hall or the recreation area. The officers are never suspicious. Sweat and Matt rarely eat in the mess hall, and during the evenings, it's quite normal for them to paint in their cells. They only ever cut one at a time for 10 to 20 minutes, while the other uses a mirror to look down the landing for approaching guards. If a guard is seen, both men jump into their beds and pretend to be asleep or look like they're painting or listening to music. One day, Palmer almost catches them, but he's just come by to give them some more prison hooch of which Matt drinks a ton. It takes Sweat three weeks to cut a hole that's 17 inches by 12 and a half inches. For Matt, an 18 and a half by 14 and a half inch is complete in four weeks. The older, bigger man is always lagging behind, which in time to come will be a matter of life and death. Week 66. When Sweat's able to crawl through his hole, he starts leaving a dummy in his bed, so if the guards walk past his cell, they'll think he's sleeping. The dummy is hardly a work of art, and if those guards just paid any attention, they'd likely see it for what it was a pair of stuffed pants and a prison issue sweatshirt. Once sweats through a hole, he clips a painting against the outside with magnets he's stolen. Now he's free to explore. Week 67. One day, when he returns after his adventure, he tells Matt that he feels like a ninja. What freedom he has during these nights. But what he doesn't know is the hidden complexities of a giant prison. One night, Sweat manages to descend down three tiers. There he finds himself in a place that's littered with objects that have been thrown away over the years cigarette butts, bits of paper, styrofoam cups, and plastic bottles. After a bit of a walkabout, he gets to B Block, just below the laundry building. This is progress. To get from B Block to C Block, he has to crawl through a steel pipe and that pipe is blocked by a steel brace. Cutting this will not be easy at all. Even if he can, he's not sure if the heavyset mat will be able to squeeze through the pipe. Luckily for them, Sweat has found a measuring tape on his nightly walks, so he can now measure the pipe and also Matt. Matt will be able to get through the pipe, but it won't be easy. Weeks 68 through 70. 
It takes Sweat two days to saw through the brace, only to become somewhat discouraged not to find the sewer system but some old boards in front of a great big cement wall. This is now turning into a mission of intense labor, but it's that or getting old in prison. He spends the next few nights shuffling around the subterranean maze of passageways under blocks C, D, and E, but he keeps hitting more cement walls. At least he's got tools and a nightlight, but he has to be careful, he's so close to the catwalk, up above he can see the guards walking around. One night a discarded cigarette butt hits his head, and when he looks up he sees a pair of officer's shoes. Just one wrong move and he's done. Sweat is so tired from these nightly jaunts that he never gets enough sleep. Each night after head count at 11.30 he leaves his cell and he doesn't get back until 5.30 am. That's how much work he's doing, and he can hardly just sleep during the day. He has to work, and if he tries to sleep someone will get suspicious. He looks so ragged that an officer remarks that Sweat's appearance has changed. My god, what the hell's happened to him? The officer tells another officer. He looks as if he's been rung through a knot hole. He's so frail and exhausted. That's true, Sweat has lost 30 pounds since he started this exploration. Still, he is now fit as a fiddle, and this will bode well for him in the near future when he's on the run and has to turn into a veritable Iron Man. Week 71 Sweat now admits to himself that the only way to freedom is to take apart one of those cement walls. He starts removing three or four bricks a night out of the wall that is just three layers thick. He's basically dismantling a prison from the inside, which is why the authorities will be astounded in the time to come. As luck will have it, one day Sweat opens a contractor's gang box in a tunnel under E-Block, and inside is a gift from God, a sledgehammer. This won't be the last time he gets so lucky that he'll start thinking he has angels on his side. Let's just say here that he doesn't think he deserved to get such a long prison sentence. He thinks the sledgehammer is his good karma. Weeks 72 through 74 He has to do the wall smashing ever so delicately, only striking the bricks whenever the pipes start to moan and scream. Within two weeks, he's breached the wall. This is it. Now he's close to the outside. Or at least he thinks he is. After winding through yet more tunnels, he comes across his biggest obstacle yet. That's a seven-foot thick son of a gun in the shape of a perimeter wall of the entire prison. At least he knows this is the last thing he has to get through. It's impossible. The wall's a huge block of cement that can only be knocked down with a machine. Even Matt joins him down there for a couple days when he's just too exhausted to do the work by himself. Matt's highly impressed with all the work Sweat's done. He looks at him and says, man, I can't believe you've done this. I've given up weeks ago. Matt's seen everything in his life. He's a career criminal who got involved seriously with crime at a young age. Later in life, a cop once described him as being the most vicious evil person I've ever come across in 38 years as a police officer. Matt escaped from a care home for children when he was 12 by riding away on a horse. He stayed alone in the forest for two weeks. Even with his crazy existence of his, he thinks Sweat's tunnels are on another level. Still, Sweat cannot get through the wall. No amount of bashing with a sledgehammer will work. Now he has another idea. There's a steam pipe. Why not crawl through that? It's another tight space at just 24 inches and it's hot as hell, but Sweat thinks it's doable. Normally, you wouldn't be able to crawl through hot steam, but it's now May and the prison has just turned off its heating system. It'll still be warm in there and it's 20 feet long, but it can be done. Week 73 through 75. He struggles with the pipe, but after buying an extension cord from the prison commissary and rigging up some more lights, he knows he can take his time. He then returns to that gang box of tools and inside is a power drill, a hammer, an angle grinder, battery packs, more lights, and even some masks for all the dust. Again, he puts this down to karma and the wrongs of America's justice system. He still needs more tools, so he tells Matt to tell Mitchell to buy two chisels, a steel punch, and some bits for the drill. Stuff they say they need for picture frames and other handiwork. This won't be easy to sneak in, but then Matt gets the idea for Mitchell to hide the bits in ground beef and then freeze the meat. If anyone asks, she'll say it's for the guys to make burgers. If anyone complains, well, that's harassment. She tells Matt she feels guilty about what she's been doing to her husband Lyle, as Lyle's arranging a surprise anniversary gift for her. One of Matt's paintings, she tries her hardest to stay out of his way. She now has a new word for Lyle calling him a glitch in her life. Week 76 It's at this point that Matt tells her that he and Sweat are going to escape. That's why they've been asking for so many things. Sweat will be upset about Matt doing this, but Matt knows Mitchell won't breathe a word about it. She's attracted to Matt, but she hasn't given up on loving Sweat. Now she thinks if these guys leave, I've lost everything. She won't tell on them, but them going is something she doesn't want to think about. Matt can sense this, and for the first time he starts to get nervous. What if she does lose her cool and blabs? He talks to Sweat about it, and they come up with an idea. Weeks 77 and 78 Matt puts his arm around Mitchell's waist when they're in the storeroom and he whispers in her ear, why don't you come with us? He tells her she can finally be rid of that useless husband and he and Sweat will take care of her. 
This manipulation goes a step further when Matt and Sweat agree that Sweat needs to confess his undying love for Mitchell. Matt starts passing her letters that Sweat has written, notes that talk about how much she misses her, and signs off with XOXOXO. I want to feel myself inside of you, he writes, while he and Matt laugh out loud. And after this, she starts bringing in so many tools Sweat's pipe cutting gets easier. In one letter, he writes, I love you, can't wait to get you in my arms and make love to you. Then at the bottom he writes, P.S. I need some more of those drill bits, XOXOXO. All these notes are destroyed after reading, just as Matt's told her to do. Week 79 But Matt feels she still needs to be worked on more. One day, he finds an opportunity to move things along when they're both together in a room next to Taylor Shop 9. Matt says he needs a machine part, but he doesn't really. He grabs her out of the blue and kisses her. For a moment, she's taken aback, but man, is this guy strong. And he's so attractive. Still, she thinks, does he have to be so forceful? You can love two people, you know, Matt says. We both love you. This is a man with extreme violence toward women in his criminal history. His sweet words are tinged with so much darkness. Almost immediately, it's arranged that she'll be the getaway driver once they're on the outside. And she'll have the car and she'll have food and money. As she's lying in bed with Lyle, ignoring his entreaties to have sex, she sees the three of them with a motorbike rental business somewhere on the coast of Mexico. The next day, she goes out to buy some new underwear, sexier than her usual stuff. Poor Lyle thinks it's for him. Week 80 The inmates notice that Mitchell starts dressing nicer and suddenly she's losing lots of weight and doing her hair differently. During her lunch break, she reads her new book, Madrigal's Magic Key to Spanish. What they don't know is that at home, she's taking photos of herself naked and later handing them to Matt so both he and Sweat can utilize them while they're alone in their cells. She's living a fantasy. Her photos are burned and certainly not used to facilitate orgasm. Matt tells her to buy black cargo pants for the escape. On the honor block, you have to wear prison-issue pants, even though you can have civilian tops. He tells her to get a tent, some sleeping bags, fishing poles, and a hatchet. Oh, he says, we'll also need one rifle, one shotgun, and a load of ammunition. Off she goes to the hardware store and later to the gas station to pick up a map of the local area and beyond. Matt and Sweat decide that at first, after escaping, they'll drive a few hours and rent a cabin up in the mountains in Vermont. Matt and Mitchell will pretend to be husband and wife and Sweat will be the nephew. This plan changes pretty quickly after Matt says he has connections with the Mexican drug cartels, so if they get to Mexico, they'll have a safe place to hide before they head to the beach and start their new business. The plan suits everyone, but more so Matt, who has a tattoo on his body saying, Mexico forever. Week 81 Sweat tells Mitchell via a note handed to Matt that they should go scuba diving together once they're there, which almost brings tears to her eyes. As much as she's attracted to Matt, her future fantasy is with Sweat only. When that happens, Sweat will have already changed his name to James Tuttle and Matt will be Tony Goya. That's the plan anyway. It's about this time that Matt makes a strange request. He asks Mitchell to smuggle in a bottle of Bacardi 151 and a bottle of wild turkey. Let's just say that Matt has had alcohol problems in the past and as you'll soon find out, Booze is going to play a big part in what happens to him. She does as is told, but draws the line when he asks her for a handgun, a micro knife, and a cell phone. You might now be wondering, what about Mitchell's ever faithful husband? He adores his wife. He would chop off his right hand to keep her safe. Will she not miss him one bit? One day, Matt asks her about him, to which she replies with a snarl, Oh, pop my husband, he's worth more to me dead than he is alive. She means it too. She tells the guys that on the night they leave, they should go to her house and shoot her husband dead with the gun she's bought for them. She's done with him. He's boring. He's a creep. And God knows she can't stand sharing a bed with him. She looks at Matt in all seriousness, as if she's thought about this a lot in the night, and says, or I'll drug him until he's passed out and then we'll take the car and drive him off a cliff. At least that won't look like murder, she says. Even Matt with his dark past is thinking this woman is cold. Matt agrees and Sweat also agrees, but they're both playing her. Still, Matt goes to the prison hospital and gets some pain medication for a nerve pain he has. He later passes them on to Mitchell and tells him to keep him in her purse until the big night. Week 82 It's almost time, and Sweat is just about done with the steam pipe. It's thick and it breaks a lot of blades, but two pounds of hamburger meat stuffed with blades saves the day again. Mitchell does the stuffing, but Palmer is the one who takes it out of the freezer and walks it to the block without going through the metal detectors. He has no idea what's in the meat, though. The heat is now killing Sweat as he tries to cut the exit hole in the other end of the pipe. He again puts his brilliant mind into action and makes a ventilation system using the fan, a bunch of plastic bags, and a t-shirt. He fastens all the bags together to make a tube and connects them with rubber bands to the fan. And hey presto, he can now stay in the pipe for hours at a time. Week 84 Sweat pushes out the last bit of pipe. On the other side, he walks for a while until he sees a manhole. 
He then cuts the chain it's locked with using his hacksaw blades and pushes it out. It's his first taste of freedom in years. Looking over the street, he sees the local school, and boy does he grin a wide grin. He knows he's at the intersection of Barker Street and Box Street, and he knows the guards in the towers can't see this area. It's 4 in the morning and he thinks, right then man, I could just go now and have 90 minutes until they do morning roll call. But he puts an end to that thought and remembers he must stick to his word and get Matt out too. His loyalty might just be his downfall. When he gets back to his cell, even though he doesn't smoke, he lights a cigarette and uses a mirror to show Matt what he's doing. Matt whispers back, are you serious? Are you kidding me? You made it through? Sweat takes a drag and replies, no dude, I made it out twice and I came back. They decide they'll go in the night. Sweat writes one last letter to Mitchell and it says, Tonight's the night. Meet us at midnight. Park your car at the manhole in the intersection of Barker Street and Box Street. Leave it running, but turn off the headlights. Get out of the car and pretend you're on the phone. That way if anyone sees you, they won't become suspicious. See you soon, my love. XOXOXO. P.S. I can already see us swimming with manta rays. She doesn't know what a manta ray is, but it sounds exotic. The question is, can they rely on her? Sweat doesn't know that she's been stressed of late. A few days ago, there was a big fight in the prison and it looked like there'd be a full lockdown. This always gets to people, but there was also an incident in the workshop when a new officer turned up and actually did his job, meaning he told Mitchell not to get too close to the prisoners, especially Matt. She huffed and puffed and slammed a few doors, and she did wonder if the prison was somehow onto her. It got worse when the officer told her to get away from Matt's workstation even though she told him there was no work to do right then. This was harassment. She shouted at him, leave my freaking inmates alone. If they don't have any freaking work, they can't do no work now, can they? The officer shot back, ma'am, I'm security, we can't be having this in the shop. What a bully, she thought. How dare he? She kept quiet, though knowing that any more trouble could get in the way of the guys escaping. She couldn't sleep for a few nights after that. Week 85. The last time she got to talk with Matt, he tells her, if you're not there, we're dead. They're going to kill us, you understand? They're going to kill us. She nods her head like a chastised child. June 5th, 2015. Hour 1, the day of the escape. The inmates on the honor block are surprised when Matt gives away his colored TV. In the next cell, Sweat puts all his things together in a guitar case. Clothes, new boots, 20 packs of peanuts, 40 granola bars, and 12 sticks of pepperoni. He doesn't know it yet, but they're going to need that food in a big way. Hour 23. The two leave through their holes. They follow the tunnels and are on their way. Sweat leaves the smiley face note and another one with a picture of an alien. Are you trying me, punk? He's written on the picture. It's stuck to a metal surface with a stolen magnet. Another kick in the teeth for the authorities. When they arrive at the steam pipe, Sweat enters and makes it through easily. Matt gets stuck, so Sweat has to throw a sheet and drag him out. When Matt comes out of the other end, his pants are down. Sweat smiles and says, oh Matt, I didn't know you cared. It's 11.50, a bit too early, but they get out through the manhole anyway and wait on the road. Under his breath, Sweat says, Shawshank ain't got nothing on me. It's true, this is better than any Shawshank escape. It's the greatest escape in US prison history, but it's not over yet. Sweat knows that they don't look too sketchy standing there in the street, even if they are wearing prison issue pants. They have a guitar case and let's face it, who escapes from prison with a guitar? They're just two guys who have been out playing with their band. Hour 24. Things then take a turn for the worse. Matt sees a car coming down the street and he bolts into someone's garden. Sweat just stands there, thinking why the hell's he running? The driver sees Matt, gets out of his car and shouts, hey, what are you freaking scumbags doing in my yard? Sweat replies, oh man, I'm sorry, I apologize. We were just cutting through, we were on the wrong street. Thankfully, the guy seems to believe him even though there's a prison just up the street. The guitar case must have worked. This guy will later tell the cops, who escapes with a guitar case? But Matt is wired as hell and every time he thinks he hears a car, he bolts again. This is making Sweat very anxious. Rick, he says, just act normal, we are normal, we're civilians. Matt has issues, mental health issues, and inside the prison, that hasn't always been obvious to Sweat. Now that they're on the outside, he sees the desperation in Matt. He knows he'll strike first and ask questions later, if anyone should even look like they're getting in the way. 24 hours, 50 minutes. Why does Mitchell fail to turn up? And who exactly are these two convicts now free to do what they want on the outside? They both curse under their breaths. Unbelievable. She backed out. This is what love means to her, thinks Matt, who's offended even though he's gladly cut her head off with a blunt knife. Where is she? What's happened? Earlier that day, at 3.30 p.m., Mr. and Mrs. Mitchell clock off from work and head home, stopping for something to eat on the way. In her purse are those pills. She's panicking, and all through dinner she can't eat a thing. Lyle sits opposite, as always, concerned about her. Are you okay, Tilly? He says. She ignores him, as she always does. When they're home, she says she feels strange. It's a feeling she's never had before. She's dizzy. Her heart is beating faster. Something's wrong. What's happening to me, she thinks. It's a panic attack. The first one she's ever had in her life. 
Lyle tells her to sleep it off, but when she wakes about 9 p.m. it's starting to happen again. Lyle then drives her to the ER, where the guys are waiting on the street at midnight she's in the hospital. At 2 a.m. she tells Lyle, you go home, I'll be okay here by myself. In her mind, when he goes home, he's going to meet with two men with a history of violence. She believes they're going to kill Lyle because that's the plan. They'll then take the car and drive away. The next morning, she's surprised when Lyle turns up at the hospital and says he's taking her home. He gives her a big hug and she looks over his shoulder, wondering what the hell's going on. Now, we must explain something. Two men are on the loose and they will not go back to prison, never mind what it takes to stay out. You need to know why they're in prison in the first place. Both of them had horrid upbringings, but Matt's was arguably worse. He was in and out of foster homes as a child, and when he did see his family, was often in an environment of extreme violence. By the time he was a teenager, he was already stealing cars, taking drugs, and beating people up, including women. He escaped from the children's home, and later he escaped from jail. One time in jail, he agreed to kill another inmate's wife and children, for a price, of course. That inmate turned out to be an informant, but if that plan had gone through, Matt could have murdered innocent people. On December 3, 1997, Matt and another guy turned up the house of William Rickerson. Matt's former employee. Rickerson ran a food brokerage firm and Matt knew he always kept lots of cash. It was a cash business with hefty takings. Matt needed some money, wanting to head to Canada where his stripper girlfriend was waiting. The guy, getting on in age, had always liked Matt and tried to help him any way he could. It was this trust that helped Matt get into his house. He punched his frail body as soon as he walked through the door and then started looking for the cash. Matt grew angrier when he couldn't find any, tying Rickerson's hands and feet and beating him around the face. They then kidnapped him and shoved him in the trunk of their car. They stopped the car on the highway and opened the trunk. Matt punched Rickerson, stabbed him in the leg, and demanded to know where the money was. The old guy said he had no money. He'd never had a safe or anything like that. After 27 hours of intermittent torture, Matt started to believe him. There was no money. But now Rickerson would go and tell the cops, and Matt would end up back in prison. Looking at Rickerson covered in blood and bruises, Matt slammed the trunk. The next time he opened it, he strangled him. He pulled the dead body out of the trunk at the side of the road and covered it with sticks. Later, Matt returned to the scene of the crime with a hacksaw, did the dismembering, and threw bits into the Niagara River. He then fled to Mexico, where he later stabbed an American engineer while they were both in a bathroom. The guy died and Matt got away with only a few bucks. The Mexican cops later arrested Matt and in 2007 the Mexican government extradited him back to the US. A report said he'd been a difficult prisoner and had tried to escape, getting shot at a few times doing so. The Mexicans didn't want him. No one wanted to be near him. Even his own former attorney in the US said Rick Matt was fun, but dangerous guy to hang around with. In court, Matt heard his parole was up in 2032, when if he survived, he'd be an old man. God, he hated prison. When a detective who'd known Matt all his life heard that he had escaped from prison, he said it's not a good feeling to know he's out there. Anything's possible with Rick Matt. Sweat was not anywhere close to Matt in terms of danger, but he too had to trouble the youth, not afraid of using violence. He was always known as the brains of the operation when he and others committed burglaries. But he also got caught and, like Matt, did some time in prison early in life. Then on June 4, 2002, he and two other guys were on their way trying to deliver some firearms they'd stolen when a young sheriff's deputy pulled them over. This man had a wife and two young children at home. A guy sleeping in his house nearby heard three pops which startled him from his sleep. Soon after, he heard a car screeching. He put on some clothes and went to see what was up. He found a young cop lying in the park on the tarmac, his body horribly twisted from being run down by a car. As he lay on the floor, the car had reversed over him, and he still wasn't dead though. He pleaded for his life and cried out that he had kids at home, and then one of the guys fired two bullets into his face. Sweat later admitted in court that he had fired the first shots at the officer but not the two that hit him in the face. He said he only fired back because the officer pulled a gun on him first. Sweat hit him once, but it was just a nick. The court heard that after that, the driver reversed over him. Sweat got out and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, only for the other kid to fire those bullets. The family of the victim wanted Sweat and his friends executed, but after a guilty plea, he got life behind bars. He always felt bad about what had happened that night, but he also believed he didn't deserve to grow old in prison. His friends were crazy, not him. Sweat's sentence was life without parole, so the thought of escaping never left his mind. Day 2 After the Escape Mitchell is under suspicion soon after police find the tunnel and talk to prison officers and other inmates. Sweat and Matt are covering as many miles as possible, sticking to the woods. Everyone's after them, the cops, the US Marshals, the FBI, the border cops, and the rangers. A $75,000 reward is on their backs, and people are told to approach with great caution. I have no idea, says Mitchell, when the state cops ask her if she knows where Matt and Sweat might be. They don't know she's involved, but they have a good idea she is. The prison staff have already talked about all her close relationships with the pair and her habit of taking things in for them. 
She pretends to be as shocked as anyone, saying at one point how the hell did they get out of Clinton Correctional because I just, I've never heard anybody getting out of here. That's why I just, I mean, how did they even escape out of here? She is as bad an actress as she is a wife. The next day she cracks up a little bit saying, okay, I might have brought some stuff in for them, but I never knew what they were up to. She certainly doesn't admit to planning to go with them and have her husband killed. But as time goes on, she folds. She admits most of the story, but not everything. The only ones who know the full story are the ones on the run. On June 12th, Mitchell is arrested on a felony charge of promoting prison contraband and misdemeanor criminal facilitation. Little by little, over many hours of interviews, she talks more and more about what really happened. Days 4 through 10. Even with hundreds of people looking for them and bloodhounds scouring the local forests, the pair managed to evade the authorities. It's believed they're heading to Canada, but it could be Mexico, or they could just be staying put. No one really knows. What is actually happening is they are found a cabin in the woods, and it looks like it's not being used for a long time. There, they get some needed rest and some food, and they even find a 20-gauge shotgun. Sweat thinks again the angels must be watching over him. He's vindicated in this respect again when he goes to the bathroom and finds a loaded pistol hidden above the door. They find something else too, but at this, Sweat is not impressed. There's a big stash of booze that Matt soon starts swigging down in enormous quantities. Sweat's trying to get them to freedom and it's as if Matt doesn't care. He's getting wasted like a teenager who's found the key to the family booze cabinet. Matt says he needs it. They've walked and run around 30 miles already. Both have blisters on their feet and cuts and bruises on their bodies. When Sweat reprimands him, the much larger Matt gives him a look that says, I've killed people for less, know your place, little guy. But again, Sweat realizes that Matt is very unstable and he's certainly not the type of man you want to fight. He doesn't dare say anything when Matt refuses to stop drinking the next day or even turn off the TV he's always watching. Day 11 and 12. They can't stay in the cabin forever, so they head off. Now though, Matt's half-baked and he can't keep up. When Sweat loses his temper, again there's a threat of violence. Matt still has the shotgun, and Sweat has the pistol. It's around this time that Palmer's charged with a bunch of felony crimes all related to the things he's done for the guys. He will resign from his job, spend six months in jail, and pay $5,000 in fines. Day 20. They're both waiting at the side of the road when Matt says he's going to hold up a car with a rifle. Bad idea, thinks Sweat. He pleads with him not to do it, it will attract unnecessary attention, and he also knows that Matt will not think twice about killing someone. That's not what Sweat wants. Nonetheless, Matt waits in the woods close to the road with his gun, still drunk. Sweat shakes his head. They'll never work, he thinks. And so he runs, and he runs, and he runs, and he runs. They've already covered 50 miles, but Sweat has the energy of an athlete after doing what he did under the prison. As he's taking off, a car has seen Matt and reported him to the cops. Soon, a U.S. Border Patrol supervisory agent is on the scene. Matt won't run, and he won't go back to prison. He stumbles forward with a gun and takes a bullet from the agent's M4 rifle. As the agent walks toward the body, he can smell booze from yards away. Matt's blood alcohol level is 0.18, a classification that comes with the word mentally impaired. In his final moments, he might just remember those lines in the Bible, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Day 22. Sweat has been running for so long. He's exhausted, but now within one and a half miles of the US-Canada border. He can almost taste freedom, but then when crossing a hayfield, his luck finally runs out. He's spotted by a state trooper who just so happens to be a firearms instructor. Sweat runs and the officer shouts at him to stop while aiming his gun. He doesn't stop, and a second later he's lying on the ground having taken bullets to the shoulder and arm from a 45 caliber Glock 37 pistol. Sweat's grim future. He will survive, and in time he'll end up in special housing units in the maximum security Five Points Correctional Facility. This is the place where he'll write up a very cogent escape plan and try to trade it with the prison. This is how someone can escape, he'll tell the warden. Now I've told you that, can I please see my new girlfriend? That didn't work out for him, and he was moved to another prison. In 2022, he went on a hunger strike against the terrible conditions he was kept in. A judge ruled that the state could force feed him after being restrained, and drug him if necessary. That's what you get for embarrassing the powers that be and costing the state $23 million. Sweat remains in prison today and he'll be fully locked down for years to come. Years after the escape. The Lovebirds. Lastly, what about Mrs. Mitchell and her dear husband Lyle? She has always denied wanting her husband killed, but the evidence shows otherwise. An official 142-page report states, despite her claims to the contrary, Mitchell took steps consistent with plans to murder Lyle Mitchell. The report states she admitted she took pills from Matt. But in one interview she said she'd forgotten about them, and in a separate interview she said she had flushed them down the toilet. One time she said she's never even been given any pills. That's not what Sweat said, and it's his version of the events where we get much of the other story. Mr. Mitchell has always stood by his wife's side despite the criticism he's taken for it. In an interview he said, do I still love her? Yes. Am I mad? 
Yes, all I want is for my wife to be coming home. She would never have gone through with it. That's what she told me and that she really loved me. Now that's a dedicated husband or an abused one lacking in confidence. Mitchell was sentenced to two and a third to seven years in state prison. The report states she was ordered to pay restitution of $79,841 and a 10% surcharge to the state for costs relating to the repair of the walls in mat and sweat cells and pipes and walls in the tunnels. She got out in 2020, soon after she found herself getting takeout food with Lyle. It was just like the old days. In the truck, she looked at Lyle and his familiar buck tooth smile. The glitch wasn't so bad. A quiet life wasn't so awful. Now have a look at some other escapes. In the most insane ways men escape from prison. Or have a look at this.